Hello and welcome or welcome back to Mark's Not Cast. About twice a week I talk about something that interests not very many people but does interest me. Uh, this is number 369. It is Sunday the 24th of March 2024 and as you can tell by both the episode title and the, uh, the thematically appropriate t-shirt I am talking about a record that has sold a lot of copies over the years. I think about 30 million since 1979. Pink Floyd's The Wall. This is a biggie. One of the most popular records ever made. Is it one of the best? Absolutely not. No, it absolutely isn't. The other thing I will say is, and I'd like to apologize for it, the background over there, uh, you can see is very, very bright, primarily because uh, we're in the bit just before the clocks change and the sun sets, and I can't do anything about that short of move the house, which I can't do, or move the sun, which is beyond my abilities. So. We, uh, there, there we have it. Um, the Wall is one of probably Pink Floyd's single biggest selling album. I think it's their 12th studio record. Uh, maybe, let me count that one through. Sorry, only their 11th studio album. I think I did just have to quickly check what does and doesn't count as a studio record anymore. And there are only really three or four studio albums after this, which considering this came out 40 years ago is pretty surprising. Um, before that, though, we also got to the point where the band started to do solo material uh, on, a, on a more concerted and determined basis for the first time in their life. And there were three solo records that were recorded before The Wall came out, as well as a movie soundtrack that was uh, written and, and, and recorded by Roger for a documentary about a painter called Magritte. And uh, Magritte has not been released, but you can hear it. And it sounds a lot like Roger Waters fucking about with a synth, which is exactly what it is. So don't judge me. Don't hate the player, hate the game, I think is the uh, the cliche. The first one of the solo records to come out uh, was the solo album released by David Gilmour. The self-titled David Gilmour released in, in kind of mid-1978 or so uh, came out on LP. There was a single, There's No Way Out of Here, back to the track called Definitely. And then eventually... Uh, it did get a long overdue CD release here in, I think, 2006. So if you're, uh, if you're interested and go, why? Well, I wish there was more Pink Floyd for me to listen to. This is a fine, fine record, uh, the David Gilmore debut. I haven't got a huge amount to say about it. Uh, it is a, a record made by a trio. David took the uh, the lineup of, of his band back together for I think Joker's World from 1966, which included, and I need to check the back, Rick w Willis on bass and Willie Wilson on drums and percussion, went into the studio and recorded nine songs, um, including, of course, um, a couple of songs that you will have heard. There's No Way Out of Here, which is a cover version, uh, I think, and... Um, which is uh, written by uh, K K Baker. Don't know who that is. Um, and it's it's a fine record, but it sounds like Pink Floyd B sides because when you listen to this, you can hear all the things that sound like someone for, like like the guitarist from uh, Pink Floyd has made a solo record. It's lacking, I think, the the magic that happens when you get the four people together or the three people together in the band. So. For example, the guitars are absolutely great. The drums and bass are a, a little less spacey, a little less obvious. The vocals very clearly Pink Floyd, but it does sound like it's it's a lesser kind of thing as opposed to uh, perhaps as, as good as a Pink Floyd record. But that said, really good. I really like it. I think David Gilmour is a very talented man um, and, and, and generally quite thoroughly nice as well, according to, to vicious rumors I have heard. Um, this is an original 1978 edition on Harvest Records and uh, comes in a gatefold sleeve. Uh, I don't know how much this costs or is worth these days because I bought my copy about 25 years ago when it was about £5. Um, there was also a single. This was released in, I think, Italy. Um, and it is There Is No Way Out of Here. Uh, there's No Way Out of Here. Backed with Definitely. And Definitely is uh, my favourite song from this period because it's an instrumental and it sounds just like a fantastic Pink Floyd instrumental from 1978, which near enough is exactly what it is. There is a second solo album that was released at the same period. Again, I, I, um, I like this, but I have, to take, um, I have to take a view on it. It is Rick Wright's Wet Dream. Not a great name for, us, for an album, uh, not a great piece of cover art there. Uh, you can kind of think, well, what what is it meant to be singing? I mean, basically, it is yacht rock. 
um, in the nicest sense of the word, instrumental yacht rock, uh, recorded by two members of Pink Floyd's touring band. And it sounds again like the keyboard player from Pink Floyd is off doing his own thing. So lots of good ideas on here, lots of fantastic keyboard playing, not amazing. Uh, as Roger, I think somewhat flippantly said, uh, Rick secreted these bits away on solo LPs that nobody heard, it was unbelievably stupid. Well, don't forget to, uh, you know, pull some punches, Roger. That's a good idea. This was uh, both this and the David Gilmore LP. Um, I think we're, uh, so we recorded at Super Bear Studios in France, uh, which was later used for the wall. And the reason that they recorded in France was twofold. The first one is that there was a tax issue that was facing the band. There were some investments that had been made uh, by the band's uh, then accountants um, that had gone a little bit wrong. Tax hadn't been correctly paid. And so the band had to spend a year for tax purposes dead, or more correctly, outside of the UK. That, by the way, influenced The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy uh, by Douglas Adams. Douglas Adams was uh, came from Cambridge, much like uh, most of the members of Pink Floyd. Knew some of them, uh, played with Pink Floyd in 1994 live, gave the name The Division Bell to the band's then, then final studio record in 1994. Uh, but in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, there is a, a band and uh, the... Um, can't remember the name of them now, sorry. But there is a, a singer in the band called Hot Black Desiato. That name comes from a, a bunch of lawyers and solicitors and real estate agents that are in Camden. Um, but uh, they were, for uh, plot purposes, had to spend a year dead. And that was inspired by the fact that Pink Floyd had to spend a year outside of the UK. Otherwise, they'd be hit with enormous tax and revenue implications. Uh, for some reason, I'm thinking the band is called Atomic Blast, but I know that is not the case. Um, and I'm certainly not going to look at it now because that would be cheating. Uh, but um, that is partially the reason why the band recorded at Super Bear Studios but for, for Rick and David's solo work, I think, was to check out the studio and to see whether it was any good. This is the original 1978 uh, gatefold double vinyl of the album. Uh, instrumental, I think, mostly. Um, it has 10 songs on it. Not all of them are particularly good, but there's little nuggets of brilliance where you listen to that and go, that would be fantastic on the Pink Floyd album. That would make a, a great little, you know, keyboard solo that you've got in a track off Animals, for example, or something similar to that. And, um, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite work together. The other member of the band, by the way, that plays on Wet Dream, and here is a, a rare and original One Way Records CD issue on Sony Special Music Products from the, from the, the mid 80s, um, is Snowy White, the guitar player who played in the band in Pink Floyd as their fifth live member on guitar and bass in 1977 through to 1981, and then played with Roger between 1984 and 2013. So this is uh, pretty, pretty essential if you're a Pink Floyd fan and you absolutely have got to get every single solo album in the room. Um, I'm under no illusions. It's not amazing, but it is interesting. It's really good, and it has some fantastic little moments in there. It was also reissued last year, 2023, uh, and it came on blue vinyl, and it also came on CD, uh, remixed by everybody's favourite prog rock remixer of choice, Steve Wilson uh, of Porcupine Tree, and uh, some other prog rock bands who I don't really know a huge amount. Again, it's not spectacular it's not absolutely necessary or you don't necessarily need to hear it but it's a good remix it puts the album in a slightly different context um, it makes the the cover art perhaps slightly less embarrassing not not fantastic at the same time before the wall was released another solo album was recorded but this didn't come out until 1981 uh, and that is Nick Mason's Fictitious Sports which effectively is a solo record by Carla Blay that Nick Mason uh, plays drums on and therefore has given his name to to allow it to be released. Uh, all words and music by Carla Blay. So he is basically just producer and drummer on somebody else's album and called it his solo record. It's okay, not my type of thing at all. And there is a track on it called I'm a Mineralist, which sounds so much like it's been taken from the Sid Barrett book of weird songs that it's frankly untrue. Uh, and um, well, if you're gonna get the solo albums, the Nick Mason ones are probably number four on my list of, uh, of uh, members of the band that you need to absolutely get to, not essential. So the band started working on another record and Roger 
having taken his view that you know he was the conceptual genius or the creative genius, depending on your point of view, uh, who put together uh, most of animals, uh, decided to start work on two song cycles. Song cycles by itself is quite a pretentious phrase to use. Uh, those respectively being uh, what became the pros and cons of Hitchhiking, Roger's first solo album in 1984, and another product or another project which ended up calling itself The Wall. And uh, Roger in his uh, torturous home demo studio fashion kind of programmed out all of these songs and played rudimentary acoustic guitar on them, sang them all, did all the lyrics, called himself the creative genius of the Pink Floyds, um, and then presented the band with two demo sets uh, for them to choose, one of which he said was going to be his first solo album and the other one he said was going to be the next Pink Floyd record. And this, spurred by the fact that the band suddenly had a huge tax bill, meant that they had to record and finish by a certain set date in order to get an advance from the record company, in order to get the record into the shops by the end of Christmas 1979, in order to be able to pay the unavoidable tax debts which they'd accrued. These demos are released in some form on the 2011 Pink Floyd's The Wall Immersion Edition, which is here. And this is a spectacular uh, box set, which is also woefully incomplete at the same time. Don't know how that works. Um, but it does give you an insight into what the demo period uh, was like. So I'm going to go into the box set. Now I'm only doing this because of chronology. I'm not doing this because I want to show off the box set too much earlier. Uh, but it, it does feature, uh, and let's quickly check, on the, the, the sheet of paper which tells you what's happening inside the set, which is there. Uh, it features on um, disc five and disc six, the wall work in progress, 1979. So uh, program one on CD five is the excerpts from Roger Waters original demo. And then there's uh, original demos and band demos, and then there's band demos, and then there's some David Gilmore demos, because despite what uh, what Roger might want you to know. He didn't write absolutely every last bit of every last song into the umpteenth degree of detail, despite what his ego might tell you. So let's take these uh, useless marbles out of the box set. We'll get to those later, by the way, ladies and jelly spoons. And uh, we, will, we will look at what's on Work in Progress, part one and part two, because these are the chronological uh, first parts of the, 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 the wall which were recorded and released. So program one, the Roger Waters demos. This features another brick in the wall, Mother, Young Lust, Empty Spaces, Mother. Uh, a track called Backs to the Wall, which was uh, later kind of retitled. And uh, basically little bits of demos. Not full demos, because let's not muck about here, Roger's not got the most amazing voice or production skills at this point. Um, and then we've got the original demos and band demos of the band working up the original demos into, into full songs, including uh, Teacher Teacher. Uh, which I think might turn out to be a song that ends up on, on the final cut, uh, a band demo of a track called Sexual Revolution, which is not on anything else, uh, but did appear on the pros and cons of Hitchhiking. Um, and then also band demos of a number of other tracks alongside uh, this one, part two, which features, again, most of the album in demo form. Band demos, including It's Never Too Late, and a track called The Doctor, which is comfortably numb, and then David Gilmore's original demos for Comfortably Numb and Run Like Hell. So a not easy to listen to double CD set of demos, which is perhaps not as well known as I think it should be, is, is probably the right way to describe it. These are really, really interesting to hear, to hear how the band have taken material that didn't necessarily meet the quality standard and hone it and refine it and edit it and shape it into what would be final and finished Pink Floyd tracks. And, and you know, when somebody was sitting around and going, well, I'm going to do a track called Waiting for the Worms. And you're going, sounds a barrel of laughs, Roger. And they go, yeah, I'm going to stick it on an album that sells 30 million. You know, there's an element of going, well, the band had to make the most of the situation that they were in, the, uh, the necessary kind of crunch that they had, the financial pressures that were upon them, and how to make all of, all of that fit together. Uh, um, I'll get to the, uh, the, other, the other discs on the set when we get to the reissues uh, in, in 2011. But in the meantime, we'll, we'll come back to this one, I think it's fair to say. The band had the issue about having to be tax exiles, thanks to the, um, the, the, the misconduct 
by Norton Warburg, um, the, uh, the band's then accountants. Uh, they had losses of 3.3 million pounds. They had tax loss liabilities of f between five and 12 million pounds. And uh, they had all of their respective companies and financial structures dismantled and rebuilt. Um, they had to leave the UK on the 5th of April, 1979, and then not come back until the 6th of April, 1980, the end of the relevant and associated tax year, so that they would not be hit with massive tax liabilities that could get them out of this situation. The guy that was in charge of Norton Warburg uh, was jailed in 1982 and served no multiple years at Her Majesty's pleasure um, for his behaviour. And the band that then had the, the position of having a year where they couldn't be in the UK, they had to write, record and release an album by a certain date uh, in order to, to rescue their financial exposure. And that's never the best reason to make a record, at least as someone who's never made a record, I imagine that's not really a good reason to do so. But I, you know, I could, I could be wrong. I don't know. And the recording of the album was, was somewhat difficult, uh, to say, say the least. When the, the band kind of had and started to hone and refine the material that was going to be on the album, The Wall, uh, here, uh, and bearing in mind, by the way, all the imagery which you've seen of, of Pink Floyd's The Wall largely comes from the film and the stage play. So uh, before the, the stage show was presented, all you really knew was, well, there was that and there was this and there was that. Uh, uh, this is all you knew unless you'd seen the live presentation uh, or uh, for a long period of time. And it was only, you know, three years after the film, well, after the album came out, that the film came out, that then fully kind of expanded the story so that you understood what these images meant. You could probably work out, that's the mother. Mother, do you think they should drop the bomb? That's the teacher. That's the wife, for example. There's a bit of misogyny in this, which I never really liked or enjoyed. Then there's the, you know, the judge and there's poor little pink there, whoever he is, which by the way, which one's pink? Um, all that type of stuff. And, and you you end up kind of looking at it and going, it's a concept album about being rich and miserable and being a rock star and not enjoying it. Uh, it's difficult sometimes as a person to sympathise too much with that. And, and one of the reasons it's difficult to sympathise with that is because I've never been a millionaire rock star. Um, I, I mean, there's, there's lots of things that have happened in my life that I, that I'm, and my brother's life that I can relate to in the context of the, of, of the wall as a story, but they're not things that necessarily I, I look at and go, core baby, that's really me to quote, uh, you know, um, I think it's John Otway. Um, these, these things where you kind of look at it and you go, right. So the experiences which are, which are told inside the wall, which apparently is meant to be semi-autobiographical, even though at one point, you know, he, uh, Roger, I think, auditioned to be the lead in the film and then Silto said that his, the character was called Roger as opposed to Pink uh, and then making Pink and, and Roger interchangeable is kind of like pretty obviously he thinks that Pink Floyd is his band and extension of his uh, artistic and creative identity and the other people, as he so laughably called them the Muffins at a certain point, should do as they are bloody well told. Play this, stand there, wear that and uh, don't give me no lip child, you know? Um, so the, the story that you, you have for the wall. Um, and this is where Bob Ezrin was, was, was brought in to help um, shape and mould the album into a finished piece of work, is that he wrote a script for an imaginary film for, that the LP was the soundtrack for. Um, and whilst Roger thought it was autobiographical and there was a Sid metaphor in there, um, Roger saw himself as the head boy um, in, in the dynamic. So picking on Ezrin, bullying people, showing and demonstrating the power dynamic, it's going, you're all here to you know, serve my ideas and how it's going. But Ezrin bit back. Uh, and even though he, he helped mold and shape that, he said, I'm not going to be treated like that by you. Then the dynamic that you've got inside the, the film and also, of course, the, uh, the, 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 the album is a story of effectively an orphaned child uh, whose father died in the war at a repressive school and coping with and living with that and then how that forms and influences future behavior as an adult emotional repression unavailability the lack of a suitable father figure all those type of things um, so I, I went to school in in england in well between in the 70s and 80s and I recognised the environment that was in the wall very, very much, you know, in my life. Um, there were repressed school teachers who had serious anger issues, who served in the war, that were, you know, beaten to within an inch of their lives by their fat and psychopathic wives. There were 
children that were brought up in environments where they didn't have adequate father figures. So if, let's say, you know, when I went to school in 1977 or 1979, um, if you had lost your father at the age of, you know, three in 1945, then you would have been 37 at that point. You know, you would have been a teacher. Um, and certainly one of the teachers at my school, Mr. Hearn, the, um, the headmaster, apparently um, spent two years in a Japanese concentration camp in the, in the 40s um, and had a, a, an experience where his best friend at the camp was shot in front of his face. Um, now, I have no idea whether that's true or not. Mr. Hearn's dead now, so I can't check with him. But that's the rumour that went around school. And these were, these were not uncommon rumours in the 80s. So you then think about the environment that you've got the war being brought up in about you know, teachers that are, that are deeply scarred and traumatised by war, loneliness, unavailability of parents, emotionally repressed and unavailable parents. Uh, and suddenly you kind of go, I mean, certainly when I was listening to this when I was 14, for example, uh, as a, you know, 1987, 1988, and I kind of thought, wow, I can really see a lot of this stuff in the world around me. Um, and of course, there's the, uh, the the concept of well, you know, if you kill someone, you make a next generation of martyrs. You cre you add trauma, and and then you know you create something that's going to come back to get to you. That's what the war was to me. Um, and on the, on the other hand, I was also kind of at the point where I was going, you know, you're really bloody rich, you're successful, you don't have to worry about money, you've got a really good career, you've got all the material kind of um, elements of success available to you and you're wondering about how the fact your daddy doesn't love you and it's like well th there are bigger problems now you think about maslow's hierarchy of needs which i have mentioned before i like their early stuff i don't like their later stuff maslow's hierarchy of needs their second album is particularly good but maslow's hierarchy of needs is obviously you've got things like self-actualization at the top and then at the bottom you've got things like you know food shelter warmth being alive um and from a more existential basis, when I was 14 or 15, I was thinking, you know, are we going to have enough food for, or are we going to have enough money for food? Are we going to be able to have jobs? Are we going to be able to have homes? Those type of things. Whereas, you know, uh, Roger was, was grappling with, uh, why, how am I going to cope without my daddy? Um, which Rick was pretty cutting about. Uh, he's described the final cut, I think, as an album about more songs about his dead dad. And let's let's be let's be a little flippant about it. It doesn't take very much to be in the dead dad club. It just means you need to have your dad who's dead. Or in my case, I'm in the mum's dead club because my mum's dead and my dad isn't. Uh, you know, or the my dead dog kind of club. It's it's not an exclusive club that very few people get into, and we need to be uh, allow ourselves the the space and freedom to be ourselves and not to hang upon certain events that have shaped us as the only thing or the reason or the cause or the root uh, of, of you know, past bad behaviour. Roger saw the wall as very autobiographical and there are elements inside that that are clearly autobiographical. The phone call at the beginning of, I think, Don't Leave Me Now, um, where he, he talks to or he rings you know, his, his wife's home and the phone is answered by an American person or a British person. It says there's a collect call from America and he hangs up and he's like, well, that pretty clearly tells me that after I've played a show to 10,000 people, I'm, my relationship as it is, is over. Uh, which was a, a you know a position where hopefully you've never been in that position. Um, I've been in that position. I do not recommend it to anybody. Uh, and when I was in that position, I didn't write a double album moaning about how all women were evil and terrible, and then getting someone to draw a picture of somebody that kind of looked or was like a representation of my sex fixin' wife as um, a terrible human being that was out there to destroy me because that borders dangerously close to misogyny. And frankly, let's leave hats like Andrew Tate for that kind of nonsense. So with that in mind, the recording of the album uh, was complicated. Um, there were some real big issues around it. Uh, Rick was made a producer, uh, but he just sat there and didn't contribute, apparently. Uh, the recording was, was pretty rough. Uh, Nick finished quite early. David and Roger worked from 10 till 6. Uh, Rick worked later in the evening. And there was a, an issue where in order to make the Christmas 1979 release date, uh, Rick was asked to come off his summer holidays, boating around Greece and finish the recording, which he refused to do. And even though extra percentage points were offered if the album had been finished by December 1979 with a new publishing deal, uh, Rick didn't want to come back. So Roger said that he was going to sack Nick 
uh, but he could stay on a salary for the outstanding shows. This is where the power imbalance in Pink Floyd started to happen, where Roger started to wrest control of the ship from everybody else. Now, there's a, always in any relationship, there is a, a power dynamic, an imbalance, where someone else has perhaps more power or less power, and that changes over time. Think about the Stone Roses, for example. John Squire wrote almost every song in its entirety for the second coming, whereas the previous record had been written uh, jointly between Ian Brown and John Squire. But here, Roger Waters was going, I'm bringing all of the material to, this, to, this, to the case and um, then thinking that he was the only person who could write, whereas perhaps Rick and David didn't necessarily feel that their contributions were listened to or adequately credited as per the situation on animals, where I think, uh, what is it, dogs get a you know, a, a co-write credit between David and Roger, but then you've got these huge keyboard solos from Rick and he doesn't get anything apart from a performance credit, as if somehow somebody else had said, Rick, this is how the solo goes and you have to play it and you don't get paid for writing it, which to me feels a little bit unfair. The thing that always breaks up bands, as Thomas Dolby has said, is power and money. And uh, Roger wanted to wrest control of Pink Floyd over everybody else and uh, nearly succeeded, actually, until he realised that he, was, he wasn't going to, to win. Some people, they, they hand over the keys from the first moment, such as you know, Oasis to Noel Gallagher, and other bands, they don't. And uh, that's where, where some of the problems start to come from. So the album was originally intended to be a double. Uh, CBS wanted to pay lower royalties, but Roger refused. He said, and quite reasonably, why should I give you extra royalties for something that I've created that you've got nothing that you've had nothing to do with and they kind of saw that point of view um, and perhaps they realized they really wanted a you know Pink Floyd double album by Christmas 1979 so everyone can buy it for Christmas because in those days you'd buy Christmas presents for your relatives and you go oh I've bought you the Pink Floyd album it's going to be amazing it's going to be so much fun no, it isn't. This is not a fun record at all. This is a 90-minute trawl through misery and self-pity and feeling sorry for yourself. Although, of course, this copy, um, not, not the copy I had uh, originally, is a present. It uh, says, love from uh, Gail and Angela. All the best for the future. Okay, is written on there. So thanks, Gail and Angela. Um, I assure you it's gone to a loving home now. I don't know who Gail and Angela are. I don't even, I don't think I've ever met a Gale, actually. Uh, I've met a few Angelos, but not a Gale. And these, uh, you know, presents for what, what people do. Um, so it's a double album. I've spent 27 minutes. I haven't even gone through the track list of it um, because the first single from the album is the first thing anybody heard. And the first single is, and you all have heard of this track, Another Brick in the Wall, a UK number one, also a number one in America, Germany, Norway, Portugal, Israel, and South America. Backed with one of my turns. Uh, this is Pink Floyd's biggest hit by far. And in its original demo version, it's very slight. It's one verse, one chorus, and it's over. Um, and it was remixed by Bob Ezrin. So he looped it, remixed it, added the disco drums that went to it, looped the verse twice, and then put a guitar solo on it. And that is another brick in the wall. And it's one song, but it's been turned into three different versions of the same song across the course of the album. There's part one, this one, which is part two, and then there's part three. There is also, by the way, and I think it's a KXLP radio station, played a like seven minute edit, but put all of those three versions together. Not sure where it is now, if it's on the internet or anything, but it, it's, you know, should be the 12 minutes version of Another Brick in the Wall. This being their number one, open with the lines, we don't need no education, we don't need no thought control, no dark sarcasm in the classroom. Hey, teacher, leave those kids alone. Went to number one in South Africa and uh, found itself quickly and promptly deleted. Uh, after three months because it was being used as an anti-apartheid anthem by people that were not fans of apartheid, uh, which I fully understand. Here is the South African Another Brick in the Wall. And the South African Another Brick in the Wall has a very unusual B-side. It has a track called Young Lust. This is an exclusive mix and performance of Young Lust. It has a different intro and a different exit, a uh, different ending as well. So it's not been reissued. It really should have been reissued at some point on you know, the Echoes compilation or something, but it hasn't been. And uh, it's quite difficult to get. So I had to wait and get a copy that had come from South Africa uh, that was in the UK 
so this is the, the Young Lust 7 inch mix. Uh, the Young Lust 7 inch mix is very similar to the version that's on the film, but not quite the same. So there you are, an exclusive and unusual Pink Floyd's 7 inch track there. Um, when the album came out, it was huge. And as I've said before, it's got some uh, really great songs on it. It's got some really awful songs on it. Early versions of the album, by the way, uh, feature on side two, a track called What Shall We Do Now, followed up by um, uh, a song called What, Sh what Shall We Do, yeah. And, and so there's a lyric uh, of What Shall We Do Now, which is only on, I think, uh, the, um, or, or um, only on the, only are available actually at the moment on the now deleted DVD, an exclusive studio track of, of which was that, which was cut from the album. And by the way, it was cut from the album because of the 20 minute side length restrictions that you should have on a vinyl LP. So realistically, they should add that track back into the wall now that it's on a double LP and on a double CD because uh, it's, uh, it's only about what, 40 seconds or something you know shall we buy a new guitar shall we drive a faster car shall we work straight through the night to treat people as pets uh, all that type of stuff. fantastic song actually um moving from empty spaces to what shall we do now the lyric was on the original version of of the album um you know and it's on it's on the original it's on this this sleeve as well here actually uh the lyric where he goes Shall we buy a new guitar? Shall we drive a more powerful car? Shall we work straight through the night? Shall we get into fights? Leave the lights on? Drop bombs? Do tours of the east? Contract disease? Bonk, bury bones? Break up homes? Send flowers by the phone? Take to drink? Go to shrinks? Give up meat? Rarely sleep? Keep people as pets? All of that type of stuff. It's brilliant lyric, brilliant track. Really wish it was on the LP. It isn't on the LP. The studio version of What Shall We Do Now has not been on anything apart from the soundtrack to the film, uh, which is a real shame. Uh, and, and then it goes straight into uh, Young Lust, which, by the way, is the version that's on here, this seven-inch single, um, near enough. And you can edit it all together if you've got some audio editing software, like me, and you're a geek, like me. Although... The version on the album, uh, the, sorry, the version on the seven inch and the version in the film are at slightly, slightly different tempos. So you do need to be pretty creative about that. So to promote the album, the band played live shows. They played four venues. They played about 38 live shows, uh, eight or nine shows at each venue. Los Angeles, I think Frankfurt and London and maybe New York yeah, between 1980 and 1981 um, with an expanded band including snowy white and andy bowen on uh, i think it's andy bowen on bass an extra drummer an extra keyboard player and th those four extra musicians played the first song of the live set on stage wearing masks looking like members of the band which is particularly cheeky uh, as if to fool you so the idea of so you thought you might go to the show uh, to put on this warm confusion, this space cadet glow around the idea. It says, Pink isn't well, he's back at the hotel, he sent us along as a surrogate band. Uh, you're going to find out where your fans really stand. And then having that played by not even the members of Pink Floyd is pretty cheeky, uh, but obviously inspired by the spitting incident during the Animals Tour, which I think was in Montreal, I think the 9th of July, 1977, where Roger spat at the fan. Uh, but the idea of building a wall between the audience and the band to try and signify both the symbolic and actual gap between the, us and them. Uh, it's a great conceptual idea, it works really, really well. And the slow construction of the wall during the first half of the live show was designed to, to kind of change the staging. And then the second half of the show was largely played behind the wall with cutouts and projections and things like that. And it, it could have been that, you know, the band members were standing there you know, picking their noses or whatever because they weren't in front of people, so they could do pretty much whatever they liked. Um, apart from the section during Comfortably Numb, where Roger uh, came out and where David sat at the, stood at the top of the wall, hit by a spotlight and played the guitar whilst everybody watched, which having seen it happen once um, at Wembley Stadium in 2013 was quite an experience, to say the least. It was a really interesting, great staging, but I, I got the feeling that I didn't need to see it more than once. 
if that, that makes sense. The lighting director for the first show, for the live shows was sacked 30 minutes before the first show. Um, and in that respect, when the band played live, the LP came to life. It was expanded, it was fulfilled, the potential was shown for it. The, the images which, uh, which are on the inside sleeve here uh, were turned into, you know, um, huge inflatables and props and moved around the stage and, and vocalized the idea. So you could really tell the roles that had effectively, I hate to use this word, it was overblown and pretentious stage show uh, that was broadly similar to Andrew Lloyd Webber if he was a self-pitying prog rocker. Um, yes, I said it, it's true. Girl, you know it's true. Um, but at the same point, having seen it live, it's an effective piece of rock theatre, but there's no discipline, or more correctly, there's no um, verisimilitude in that. It, it becomes a recycle as opposed to a performance, and there's no space for improvisation, there's no space for exploring what would happen uh, in any point, or perhaps going, well, I want to play the guitar solo a little differently. You know, it's all geared to a audio track, a video track, and a story that's being told, and a narrative that's being told, and then it veers into Starlight Express, as opposed to, uh, you know, a rock show. Um, the live show didn't have a live LP released from it, although it was filmed. Um, there was a bootleg live LP, here it is, uh, or one of the many bootleg live LPs. This is a triple album of Pink Floyd Live. It doesn't tell me which date it was recorded. I worked out it's Earl's Court 1981, but after that it's a bit vague as to which, which actual show it is. Um, because it was in a triple, um, triple set, it just came with three albums on here. It's an audience recording of one of the shows on the, on, on the tour. This has a couple of extra songs which weren't on the album, uh, as I said before, What Shall We Do Now? Uh, and then later on the, the A Few Spare pr Bricks kind of extra track, which was a, an instrumental reprise if the building of the wall hadn't quite gone to plan. Um, a live album was released of the wall. It came out in the year 2000 and uh, it hasn't been on vinyl. So is there anybody out there came out in, in two, two editions? Well, there was a cassette as well, but I wasn't going to buy the cassette. Uh, there was this, which is your standard Fat Boy CD, uh, which was compiled over multiple nights. Um, and then there was a more comprehensive book box set edition. Is there anybody out there, limited edition, with a book that came in it? And the live staging, I think, really is where... where um, the wall was at its best. Um, the band rehearsed without waters for the live show for a week uh, with, with David as effectively the band's uh, musical director. Um, oh, hang on, that's upside down. I better start again. And they played, as I said, these 32, 38 shows, uh, which were so big and so expensive to stage and present um, that the band effectively lost money. The only member of the band that didn't lose money was Rick because he was on a salary. And to, to indicate kind of how the band was working, um, at this point they had four porter cabins, one for each member of the band, all facing out from each other so the band members didn't have to talk to each other until they were on stage. Um, and they were offered stadiums, which Roger refused, but uh, Andy, um, Andy Brown accepted. Uh, and in, in total, but they didn't play the stadium shows because they didn't think they could do it without Roger. And in the end, uh, the band lost £600,000 on the shows uh, because of the staging was so big, so enormous and so complicated that the costs that they charged meant that effectively they were losing, you know, I don't know, half a pound for everyone that they were, they were playing to over the course of the shows. And, and uh, they, they should have put the ticket prices up by a pound or two. But they didn't. And that's good because ticket prices are bloody ridiculous these days and they've all made more than that much money back. So Rick was the only member of the band to make any money out of the wall shows because he was on a salary. And if the rest of the band lost money, it was their problem and not him. So each other member of the band lost £200,000. Which, considering you'd put the album out in order to not uh, be crippled with enormous tax bills of you know millions of pounds, means actually the original first era of Pink Floyd with the four of them playing together um, didn't generate, or more correctly, didn't leave them with a huge amount of money in their bank accounts compared to the, the size and success of Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, and Animals, which is a pretty strange period to be, but there you are. 
that said, in the future, Roger Waters did leave Pink Floyd, and as part of the, the uh, agreement to leave the band, uh, the remaining members of Pink Floyd agreed not to stage the wall without him, which is good because Roger then took the wall onto the road and played it live in 1990, and then for a bigger tour between 2010 and 2013, where he played the wall something like 200 and 13 times live and undoubtedly made an enormous amount of money. Uh, it's a gas. So yeah, there you go. The Earl's Court shows uh, in 1981 uh, were filmed uh, for future use and they were recorded for a live album which didn't come out until 2000. This is the Is There Anybody Out There live album. The live album is recorded over multiple shows. And the easiest way, if you want to know and to tell, about the live album, which shows it was recorded at, was to compare the audience recordings of Run Like Hell with the uh, versions on here, and then realise that they've actually pulled together a much, much longer rant from multiple performances of Run Like Hell and turned it into a performance that didn't actually happen. But do you like our pig? He's a very nice pig. Oink, oink. Uh, and, and there you have it. There were two more singles that released from the album. As I've mentioned before, Run Like Hell was issued. Um, and not in the UK. I think this is an American copy. Let's quickly check where it came out. Um, oh, it doesn't say, but okay. But Run Like Hell was released as a single, but not uh, not in every country. Um, and Comfortably Numb uh, was, was also sent to radio, but I don't think Comfortably Numb was released as a single. I don't think it was. Uh, it was, it was uh, edited and, and, and put onto radio play, and eventually it did get a seven inch release has a double A side with uh, an edit and remix of Comfortably Dumb and an edit and remix of Run Like Hell on, um, on the B side, taken from the seven inch, which was released on Columbia in America as one of those Hall of Fame double A side singles sometime later in the 80s. So Comfortably Numb wasn't actually uh, a contemporary single that I remember, although it was played on the radio a lot, but it wasn't actually a contemporary single, which is pretty weird. Taking on from the idea that those shows in 1981 were films came the kernel of the idea um, that following on from the album and the, uh, the the live show. So this, by the way, is a bootleg CD of the World Lives in Earl's Court, 6th of August, 1980. This is a 1981 show from Earl's Court. And of course, is there anybody out there with multiple other shows? This is an unofficial release as well. Came the idea that Pink Floyd would release a film of The Wall. Um, which was released in 1982, and here is the, uh, the, the DVD edition of it. The film was exhaustive and exhausting. It's not fun, although I related to it a lot, and it was very cheap and shown on television quite a lot in the 80s, actually, uh, at quite an affordable uh, time. But late at night, I was like, I'm going to watch Pink Floyd's The Wall, and it is grim and unrelenting. It's like being punched in the face endlessly for about three hours about how terrible it is to be rich and famous and to not have a day job and not have to worry about money. There are lots of scenes which depict the emotional damage and impact of a lack of a father figure. There are lots of scenes which, which impact how terrible it is to sleep in fantastic hotels, drug addiction. Uh, it's really grim, and it's really about realistically, uh, somebody that is dealing with politics and power and with influence and control and not being surrounded by people that stop them, about loneliness, infidelity, all that type of stuff. Um, and how if you have a, a, an indulged ego, um, you can be, or you can paint yourself into a corner where you become a monster that does only ever what you only ever want to do and not what anybody else would ever want you to do. Um, and Roger clearly thought that this was very, very much his baby and his vision and nobody else really understood the film or understood the narrative, even though Bob had sketched out the, uh, Bob Ezrin had sketched out the, 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 the screenplay or the, the, the script for the imaginary film that the, the LP was a soundtrack to, that then became an actual script. And uh, the film was, was uh, funded with two million pounds from Pink Floyd, uh, 10 million pounds promised from MGM, and a substantial amount of money from Goldcrest, who folded before the profits landed. Um, Roger wanted to sack Alan Parker, the film's director. Uh, David and Nick opted to outvote Roger, 
uh, and that's where relationships started to break down. So Alan Parker, great filmmaker, by the way, made some really good stuff. Uh, you, you will have heard of and have seen, not just The Wall, um, did a great job. But what he wasn't is he wasn't Roger's yes man. And that's probably where some of the problems came from. Um, the Wall had two other things about it. The first one is a lot of the music material was re-recorded for the album, uh, for the film. So, for example, Mother, uh, Bring the Boys Back Home, Outside the Wall, um, Empty Spaces, What Do We Do Now, In the Flesh, were re-recorded and remixed. Um, and some of the other songs were substantially altered. Uh, they did say that they were going to release a soundtrack album to the to the wall, but then decided not to do so because the um, the state within the band was not great. Instead, we have a bootleg CD, Pink Floyd the film, uh, which is here, uh, which is uh, yeah coming out of its uh, digi pack, uh, which features the um, the soundtrack recordings. Uh, so if you want to to hear them, I suggest you go onto YouTube and find those those, those recordings. And it's been on VHS, but for some reason, The Wall has never made it to Blu-ray yet. So the only release that we've got for it is this here uh, DVD of the film, uh, which features some documentary stuff as well and some promo stuff. But it's only, you know, 480 standard definition, not high definition. Um, I think people keep asking, when are you going to release a, you know, a live Blu-ray of The Wall? Or when are you going to release a Blu-ray of The Wall full stop? And the answer is, given the state of relationships between members in Pink Floyd, maybe not for a while yet, I guess. Right. Next thing that happened, and there's more to come, by the way. Well, I just opened the curtains because the sun has now moved and it's better and I look more dramatic in this angle. As uh, what Nick Cave sang, uh, you may say that from a certain angle and from a certain light, I look quite handsome, uh, came the, the release of the Immersion Edition of The Wall in 2011 as a part of the band's reissue box set packages. This is the mother load, the, the big enchilada of Pink Floyd uh, releases and the, and the biggest and most comprehensive box set dedicated to a single album that Pink Floyd have released yet. So, I showed you the demos earlier. Let's show you what else there is that's inside the Immersion box set. This is expensive to get these days, but there was a time when it wasn't expensive. And of course, you know me, I bought it when it wasn't expensive. I'll put it that way. There are seven discs in the wall Immersion edition. There is the uh, standard studio album released on CDs one and two. Hello. There is uh, CDs three and four are remastered editions of the uh, Is There Anybody Out There live release here. So if you have that, you don't need this. Then there are two extra CDs, which I've already shown you, of demos and works in progress. These are really fascinating things to listen to. And then disc seven is a DVD, even though Blu-rays existed. And this features a, a live track, The Happiest Days of Our Lives, recorded at uh, Earl's Court. The, um, another Brick in the Wall promotional video, a behind the wall documentary that's quite interesting but not absolutely essential and an interview with Gerald Scarf who did a lot of the artwork around about this period. There is also some extra stuff that's in here so let's let's have a look in here. Pink Floyd coasters because they are difficult to uh, replicate. If you're going to do counterfeit box sets they are expensive. Uh, there's some marbles, always with the bloody marbles. Where are the marbles now? Oh I don't know. There's postcards. Yep. There's, there's postcards. Let's see what these are in here. These go with the immersion editions. Uh, another brick in the wall. Mother, run like hell, comfortably numb. Um, again, there's what, 57 Pink Floyd collector's cards, of which four go in each one of the albums, which means, strictly speaking, in order to get them all, you have to buy about 10 box sets or more. Don't do that, kids. Waste of time, waste of money. There are some postcards. Um, perhaps most interestingly, a, uh, a wall shaped ticket here. This one for um, the, the German show in Dortmund, uh, 14th of February, 1981. Uh, this one backstage pass for Nassau Coliseum in February 26, 1980. Since you don't have access to a DeLorean or a time machine, neither of those will be any use to you now. So I guess that's why they feel okay putting those in. Some Mark Fisher cards. I think Mark Fisher did some stage designs, did some stuff for you 2 and other people, giving you ideas of what the stage might look like. Good God, that's impressive, isn't it? That must have really been a thing when you saw it in 1981 or thereabouts. Really kind of blows your tiny, fragile eggshell mind. There is 
And I think this is a uh, part of the box set, although I can't remember now. Pink Floyd wall scarf, not quite sure why. Or wall banner or some other bollocks. Uh, some prints. Oh look, it's a horrible picture of a distended woman that's not at all misogynist at all. Oh no, 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 no. Uh, um, a, uh, a poster which can fold out. They're quite why well, you'd ever have this poster on, on anywhere, I don't know. A fold out poster thingy of the lyrics. Not sure why you'd ever have that. I mean, oh, I'm not the target market for this, am I? I'm somebody that's interested in music. I'm not interested in this gubbins at all. I, it's all about the music to me. Nothing else means anything. Uh, and then there's a, a booklet for the immersion box set, which features photographs of the band normally playing live. Uh, let's have a look at that. So, yep, there's Snowy wearing a mask. There's the, uh, the extra keyboard player. Uh, there's the, the four backing vocalists. Um, there's an inflatable teacher. Teacher, leave those kids alone. It, 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 I mean, I'm sure this was a, a fabulous experience to see, especially in 1980 with poor, miserable, fucked up Roger, as he said. But I, I can't see it being, you know, an amazing experience necessarily um, now because it's, you know, at the time it was undoubtedly revolutionary, but not necessarily now. And then the, the booklet, which again features more photographs of the band members and other things relating to the stage show and show on, which must have been extremely impressive to have seen at the time. Um, but uh, yeah, there you are. So that is Pink Floyd's The Wall. That is one hell of an album. Um, not exactly fun at all, it's fair to say, but one hell of an experience. I always thought this album was suspiciously close to being bollocks. Um, if nothing else, the Immersion Edition contains some stupid bloody marbles, which I've only just found. Oh look, it's a marble of a wall. It's a marble of another wall. I bet the third one's a marble of a wall. It's a marble, what is the point? What is the point of a marble of a wall? What, what? what? Bullshit, just what it is. But let's not get too distracted into that. Um, overall, The Wall as an album is too long. There's too many songs on it. Not enough of them carry the narrative. Musically, parts of it are, are uh, unmemorable, weak, difficult, hostile, not friendly, not entertaining. It's a guy pouring all his feelings out and what he thinks is his masterpiece and what ends up actually being a whining bit of self-pity. Um, and sometimes you do need somebody to come back to you and go, it's not a very good idea, man. It just isn't, okay? No, ain't nobody needs to hear that. Nobody needs to hear you whining about how women are awful, terrible, treated you wrong, and how you are an amazing human being that's been mistreated by everybody when you're richer than almost everybody else on the planet. You have opportunities that almost nobody else on the planet will ever have, and you don't even realise how bloody lucky you are. That sounds really harsh. There's a thing called paradise syndrome, where you spend all of your life working for and trying to achieve a certain state. And when you achieve that state, which is apparently paradise, you then realise you haven't solved the inherent unhappiness that you carry inside your own psyche. I think paradise syndrome is real. and I think it's important. You know, I mean, over the years, I've reached a point where very recently my life has in a material form become really, really good. Um, uh, but in a spiritual form, I'm still not particularly overjoyed about a number of things. But at the same point, I haven't written... Uh, an hour and a half double concept album about how teachers are terrible, my dad should have lived, and how all women are evil. I, you'll just have to take my word for it, okay? Because I might have done, but there's no evidence that I haven't. But absence of proof is not proof of absence. So there you are. Um, uh, but I haven't done that, and I certainly haven't taken it on the road, and certainly didn't you know, go around touring it in stadiums at the age of 75 or, or whatever, um, because I don't when I, I write stuff, I think about, well, could this communicate to anyone? Could this be relevant to anyone? Or is this just me moaning about my awful, terrible life? And um, The Wall was an album that I really struggled with. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. It, it's <laughs> difficult, and it's difficult by design. It's not intended to be easy. It's well done, but it's more like watching a really niche stage play. Uh, than it is an album. And it's got some amazing songs on it. Mother is particularly good, Empty Spaces, What Should We Do Now, uh, Comfortably Numb, of course, Another Brick in the Wall, Run Like Hell. These are great songs. 
but there's not enough material to justify a double album and there's too much material to justify a single album so it has to sit somewhere in the middle and to say that like a lot of out it was one of the very first cases of cd bloat before cds were even uh, invented which is pretty weird because the cds were first invented by the way in 1983 and they came out of holland so good work holland well done the dutch you've given us a uh, tony's chocolate and cds amongst a great many other things as well as the coolest royal family and a prime minister that cycles everywhere so good stuff um aside from that that is pink floyd's the wall the film the album the tour the singles the box sets the misery oh my god the misery and uh, next time round, when I talk about Pink Floyd, I'm going to talk about uh, a great collection of dance songs, which overlaps chronologically with The Wall. And also, um, I'm going to talk about the final cut, or as David Gilmore called it, the final straw. So take care of yourselves and each other. Stay beautiful. I'll see you soon. Okay? Live long and prosper. Stay beautiful, beautiful ones. Bye. <laughs>